Here's my thoughts and I'll share them with you. I don't claim to have all the answers, but I know that my heart is true. These are what I found out. Yeah! It's just meant to provoke some thought. Hey, let's talk about it. And everybody's not wrong all the time. We're friends, right? Yeah! All right, yeah, well, it was improvisation, you guys. <laughs> I'll try to do better next time. True or false? This raccoon is an albino. The answer is false. I'm going to set the record straight about some of the animal anomalies that I continue seeing patterns of. The biggest one that I want to talk about today is called leukism. Now, first of all, the spelling of leukism is not agreed upon. L-E-U-C or L-E-U-K, but it is pronounced Luke. Like Luke, I am your father. It's hard to say when this term came about and most people haven't heard of it. History books disagree on what it is, but mostly it is in the cell development process, the differentiation when cells are getting assigned pigments, and albinism deals with mostly just melanin, while leukism can deal with other colors, or mostly white, it pale. Uh, leukos was the Greek word for white. It depends on the color of the pigment sometimes, whether the animal looks, well, more orange or pink, but that's also leukism. In the case of animals with patterning, animals still maintain their markings, and they will even be extremely orange or extremely yellow. It is easy to tell a leukistic animal from an albino pretty immediately because albinos have red or pink eyes and leukistic animals will have regular color eyes or very shockingly blue eyes. These tigers all have various forms of leukism, so they maintain their markings in some color. Now this is a pied animal or piebald, which is usually a horse uh, coloring coloration term, but in terms of these leukistic animals that are piebald, as you can see, it's patches of white. And that happens, at, again, at the differentiation, the assigning of cells in neuro formation. Now, there have been way more cases of leukism, piebaldness, these phenomenon of just weird colored animals, dude. They're, <laughs> as you can see, that's not a normal colored zebra there. <laughs> I feel deeply that the this is a show of what our DNA is going through, the animals of Earth, and I'll get to humans in a minute, but it, there are some very strange pigmentation things that are happening at the very fundamental DNA level, and the increasing numbers of these kinds of animals, as well as the new species that they're naming after these sort of animals and others, because they're finding that the DNA is <laughs> profoundly different in a lot of species. We can observe this, we can do some scientific method and you know get some statistics going. It's very clear from any Google search that this is happening to all species on Earth, and it's observable, and across the board, across these species, you know, mammals, reptiles, everything, it seems to be the same patterns of discolorations. And so that would lead me to believe that there's a phenomenon going on with, well, the creatures of Earth. Could something have happened to our planet, to our DNA? Is there some stuff here we should be observing and talking about? Now, vitiligo, vitiligo was uh, reportedly the skin disease that Michael Jackson suffered from. And that seems to be increasing in numbers. And there is absolutely no known cause for this. We have no idea. But doesn't it look similar to the piebald animals? In fact, the Vitiligo Research Foundation's little mascot logo is a little tiny piebald deer. And so I feel like we should talk about this. I feel like we should be observing this. And we need to give this some terms too, because I'm not sure that all these things even have proper terms. I would say that sometimes they're speckled, sometimes they're white, sometimes they're sort of peppered in looking like this hawk. Birds in particular have the most available statistics about leukism, piebaldism, and other kinds of things. And I think that's because uh, there are a lot of bird watchers and they are, you know, excellent hobbyists. And if there are any watching this video, please comment if you've seen leukistic birds in your neighborhood. Some of the best statistical data that I have found um, is are from bird watchers. Um, one pointed out that leukism is not in the dictionary, huh, so they thought it was a new word. But 
Interestingly, any reference manual or index that has compiled information, they use the terms albinism usually, and they note that of all the cases of albinism, only about 7% were, quote, pure albinos, meaning those were the ones that were all white. So they're talking about leukism. They describe piebaldism and leukism exactly with the patterning there, but the color faded and things like that. But they do not use the word leukism. So it's curious. I'm going to let you decide what you think about that, but it's curious. Now, this is crazy, though. Here's where it gets crazy. <laughs> um, 50%, over 50% of the birds studied, of the total birds that they studied, were leukistic. And uh, more than that, they found that within that 51%, just looking at leukistic birds, they found certain families of them, like the swans, geese, and ducks, and the quail, uh, just certain families had way higher numbers. They made up uh, 67% of the leukistic birds, finches, meadowlarks, blackbirds. I would love to hear my, where are my bird people? Because the bird watchers are very smart. They call it leukistic when they see a bird that has miscolorings. And that tells me that they research because they know it's not albino or they wonder what's going on with the birds. They care. This is important because it is impossible to find statistics on people and that kind of discoloring. I think it's notable also to talk about the white deer that um, surround the areas of specifically high energy particle physics labs uh, of Fermilab and Argonne, both of which are located in Illinois. Uh, that kind of struck me about this whole deal. So, um, as you can see, there are yellow dolphins, pink dolphins, and again, the diversity of life that seems to be affected by these skin slash hair conditions are, it's, it's incredible. It's across all <laughs> forms of life on our planet, or if it is still a planet, quote unquote. But these are very unusual colorings. And while some of the animals are being bred purposely to look like this for various reasons, for instance, these snakes, most of them are happening in nature. And that is what is quite alarming. Look in your neighborhood. I guarantee you're gonna find squirrels. And by the way, does this one have fangs? <laughs> anyway, I, I guarantee you're gonna find squirrels. You're gonna find, um, with these discoloration, there's so many birds. Oh man, there's so many birds. And um, please, you know, comment about this. Also, if you have noticed any splotchy skin on yourself, or if you feel like you sunburn easier or stuff like that, let's just talk about it. I don't know. Let's talk about what's going on in the world and see if we can come to any conclusions. So um, this uh, pink bird here, uh, it's, it's a pigeon. And um, this pigeon stirred up quite a quite a bit of talk in the town in London. And this is a Rottweiler. I don't know if you've seen this guy around the web. Those are crazy leukism cases. This guy is supposedly a, a giraffe with vitiligo, which is supposed to be the term that humans have when they have these same conditions. So I'm just pointing that out because <laughs> that's an inconsistency. They're all listed as kind of different things. I mean, that's not called a piebald dog, but just like the dog, this bird, they have appendages and sections that aren't piebaldy and splotchy, but they're more defined on appendages like hands, feet, face. Albinos cells migrate. First of all, they do it uniformly, like they're all white, but also those cells usually have another type of pigment. For instance, these chickens have uh, heavy red pigmented cells. The red ones are called erythrophores and the yellow ones are called xanthophores. Xanthophores and erythrophores are both chromatophores, which are basically cells that uh, carry your color pigments. And leukism is seeing a lot of animals with very, very specific colorings, like heavy on the xanthophores or chromatophores. Really what's happening is when we see a lot of yellow, yellow animals, it, it's probably because the yellow pigments are actually, we're able to produce them, yellow, orange, even red sometimes, those colored pigments are actually naturally 
taken out of uh, what we eat, the beta carotene stuff, but we can actually produce the yellow uh, pigments that make tyrosine, which is essentially the enzyme that processes our colors. We've come a long way in science. We're now breeding peacocks with pigmented cells to make them various pretty colors like this mauve and this purple. But in this sort of deliberate selective breeding, things can happen like pie baldness. Now the leukism that is running rampant, it can be gray, golden, you know, pretty much any off-white, or it can be like mixed up white and splotches of normal color. And the really weird thing is the, some of these animals have these really blue eyes and it's trippy because, I don't know, it really stands out. They look like glass. And it's seen in humans as well. That happens because the eyes are a big part of the formation of the neural crest. So I made a little animation mm -hmm. video. So all of the cells, when they're first forming, they're like stem cells kind of, they're undifferentiated. They have not been assigned to make organs or do what they're gonna do, so they're blank. And they line up together in what will become the brain, the, the crest of the head. And they become, I drew in little colors because pigments form. You have black and brown and yellow and red pigments. And then they all go to their respective organs and whatnot. And that's how our systems are formed of our bodies. When they meet up at the neural crest, if they're left blank, and what I mean by blank is in this case, without pigment coloration, but if they're left without information, or if they're left with two different coded informations, they will all migrate and the cells will make the colorations and the organs with whatever information they're equipped with. We don't know a lot about how the eye controls this neural crest cell development, but we know that it does. And it gets really complicated from here with the eye specifically. Let's look at some of the things that can happen to the eye. So here is a koala known as the David Bowie koala. <laughs> and um, he has two different color eyes. That happened at the neural crest development. They went two different ways. This little guy is piebald and he has two different color eyes. And he's very pale. It can also happen in the eye itself. Like it's split down the middle, two different colors in the eye. So that's very unusual, but it's becoming more common. Cats in particular have a history of being bred to be certain ways, and so they have a lot of anomalies with their eyes. This cat is, I mean, look at those eyes, they're crazy. That's crazy. Okay, the cardinals. I've been waiting to get to this part. There have been a whole bunch of sightings of leukistic cardinals, like everywhere, and that weirds me out because part of the cardinal is that it's red, and it, these are really not red. They're just all over the place with the color. So. It's very worrisome. I would love for some bird watchers to comment on this. Um, and please do watch your neighborhoods. I've seen a bunch of uh, blue jays. Here's a blue jay that's uh, leukistic. I, I have a couple that are just almost completely white and it seems like they've been losing their color. So also in birds, well in all species, it, there can be chimeras. Chimera, this one for instance, is one side female and the other side is male. That's crazy, right? But so that happens when, again, the neural crest cells are developing and the distribution just goes opposite. This is a, a chimera of a lobster and there have been reportedly a lot of those. This is a cat named Venus. You can see the two different color eyes and it happens a lot in pets apparently. Um, people, and I don't know that their behavior is any different. I don't know, I just know their development is different. and. The frequency of these animals are, I mean, it's picking up in pace. It's like crazy. I've found an abundance of information and pictures and it's just kind of nuts. But while this is obvious in animals from just looking at them, it is definitely not obvious in humans if chimera exists. It only comes up in cases where the blood is tested and the determination is made that a person carries two distinct and separate sets of DNA. Um, and this has been recorded in cases of blood transfusions, as well as uh, maternity and paternity disputes, things like that. Like the case of Lydia Fairchild, who discovered in 2002 
that DNA showed her children not to be hers. And after a lengthy court case, it was determined that she actually was the mother and father <laughs> because she had both male and female sets of DNA. She was and also in. interesting is um, this phenomena of chimerism <laughs> is seen a lot in calico cats, which oftentimes can be leukistic as well. And I think it's interesting, calicos are always girls. Well, maybe possibly hemaphroditism going on. I don't know, I'm speculating. The blue eyes factor I think is so fascinating because sometimes it's actually bred into an entire species. This breed of dog is, uh, as you can see, piebald and has the very, very crystal blue eyes. And also you can see this breed's um, migration patterns. You can see which way his cells go by where his stripes go. Like in this pit bull, you can see from where the black goes, you can see how it, was, it started along the crest, the one, his, the dividing line, and it migrated outwards. There's at least two DNA phenomena going on, um, and I would say possibly five or so. The patterning, the differentiation cells, and then the gradual increase of loss of color. And let's talk about these blue eyes, man. I'm just going to shut up for a minute and let y'all see all these blue, blue-eyed, leukistic animals. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to play some music. was a good drum break. So let's talk about humans. I find it interesting that the term leukistic is not used uh, in terms of talking about humans, even though, quote, albino people seem to fit the description better in many cases, like these folks here. But anyway, as you can see, these people have the very blue eyes, they have the very pale skin. They very obviously fit the description of leukistic better than albino, but they're called albino. They remind me kind of of the spooky children um, in the village of the damned. But I don't want to say anything bad about these people. These are beautiful people. And this is very much a, a beautiful sort of way to look. And it cuts across race. And so it's an interesting phenomenon. But what I find fascinating is why we don't call them leukistic. When they fit the description of leukistic, they are albino, though. They're called albino specifically. And so that's an inconsistency, consistent with my findings that we've been quantum infiltrated across time and space as the whole human race. There is actually piebaldism in humans. It's weird, though. It's getting really weird. And it's not really acknowledged by the medical community, as far as I can see. It's just... I've seen it on blogs and stuff, but it's often characteristic, characterized by, yeah, whatever that word is, by a triangle shape. Because remember, it starts in the crest of your head. It's a triangle shaped pattern on your forehead of white. And the blue eyes are there in most cases. But uh, there are people around the world that are affected. With and I suppose you could be piebald and not even notice. But um, there, I also wanna just mention that this is different than vitilingo or vitilingo, which is uh, the skin disease that Michael Jackson reportedly had, which doesn't happen from birth. It actually develops over time in one person's life and it can happen to any race, any gender, at any age. They don't know what causes vitilingo. They think it might be an autoimmune disease, which is when your immune system mistakenly attacks a part of your body. Uh, but the immune system, they think, destroys the melanocytes in your skin. It's also possible that one or more genes affects vitiligo, so they think it might be hereditary, but they really have no idea. And the research about where it is in the world and what the frequency is, the rate of 
well, as you can see, this is the Vital Lingo Research Organization's world map. It's blank. I did find a map after much, much looking, but it says, because we cannot be sure whether Vitilingo was not properly documented, basically we didn't include any of the studies. <laughs> so um, one case they found 250 male high school students in Indiana and eight cases of Vitilingo among them. That would equal a prevalence of 3.2%, but this number has not been included in our collection. Also it says uh, the studies currently available you know, range from 0.6 to 2.28% in the population. And they also thought that the frequency cited prevalence of 8.8% in India was far too high, so they didn't include that. I was able to confirm that the million or so people in 1996 has doubled in the United States to 2 million something, and that's just the prevalence. There were actually 230 million, and it came with all these warnings, these statistics. And I looked at drugs that people uh, felt they were getting vitilingo from and the numbers on those charts seem to indicate that the numbers are climbing steadily a lot so i'm thinking vitilingo is definitely rising also leucoderma is the other name used for vitilingo and it's sometimes spelled with a k sometimes spelled with a c so they can't really get it right, can they? In fact, looking up information for leucoderma, aka vitilingo, was just like looking up the accelerator facilities in the world. Meaning it's impossible to find information that is all-encompassing and helpful. Now, I bring all this up to think about because all of these particle accelerators, over 30,000 in our world, is disturbing to me and I'm wondering what kind of effect this has on our DNA on our planet and on our bodies so I found this guy who does research at Chernobyl and most recently Fukushima and if you notice these spots that he's found on birds don't they look like Lucism to you or vitilingo anyway here's Here's him talking. The abundance of many species of birds are depressed in these areas of high contamination, leading to an overall decrease in the biodiversity on the order of you know 50% fewer species in hot areas than there should be uh, if, there had, if there wasn't radioactivity in the area. Mousseau says he has seen much higher frequencies of tumors and physical abnormalities, like deformed beaks among birds, compared with those from uncontaminated areas. It occurred to us uh, after visiting Fukushima uh, last year that some of those spider webs looked a little strange. And, and, and so we thought we would test that hypothesis in a very scientific way by, by capturing images of as many spider webs as we, can, as we can find in hot and cold areas of the same kinds of species to see if there's more variability or you know, less, less, less structure to the webs in these radioactive areas. It can serve as a, as a biomarker of the background radiation. We're in the town of Chernobyl, uh, downtown Chernobyl as it were, and what we found is that the frequency of aberrant color patterns on the on the back sides of these bugs is directly proportional to how radioactive the area is. The one on this side is relatively normal and then you look on the other one and you see that the black spots are kind of fused together. Rousseau's work in Chernobyl will continue for years to come. He's extended his study to Fukushima, Japan and hopes to shed a brighter light on the lasting effects of radiation on biological systems. So all of this is just food for thought because, I don't know, I discover things and I feel like I should share them. I feel like we should all talk about them, but thank you guys so much for watching. And please leave in the comments any expertise or opinions that you may want to share, any experience you may have had. And I want people to look around their neighborhoods. I really do for um, any of those leukistic squirrels and birds and all kinds of things that you might find. Because we need to talk about it. That's the only way we're really going to arrive at answers, right? So yeah, much love to you guys. And as always, feel free to like, subscribe, share, and comment. Yep. <laughs> and dance. Dance if you're feeling it. All right. Much love to you guys. See you later.